Welcome USC Trojans, students and alumni, to day two of our Financial Literacy Conference. Tonight, our topic is Investing 201. And before we hear from our esteemed alumni speaker, I'm just gonna go through a few slides for our students. So next slide. We wanna start off every session by thanking our partners, we have gold partners and silver partners. These organizations um, make a deep investment here with the Career Center, and they're very invested in hiring our students and alumni for roles. So we want to thank our partners. Next slide. And then on the left, you'll see the summer experience survey. And for the students that are online who are first years, second years, third years, or those who are graduating in December, we ask that you take the summer experience survey. Um, so we know what you're doing this summer. And if you're still looking for a job, we are hosting a boot camp event on April 16th. On the right, you'll see our first destination survey. We'd like to know what our class of 2024 May and August grads are doing. And so uh, you'll see the QR code there for our graduating seniors. Next slide. And then we just wanted to give you um, a, a look at what day three is looking like, as well as day four. So tonight we're doing Investing 201. We will um, end at about um, 5.55 p.m. so that we can move over to um, the first time home buyers session, which will begin promptly at 6 p.m. And then tomorrow on day four, we have Know Your Rights and Your Worth. And then next slide. For day four, we have making the most of your workplace benefits, mastering your credit score, sustainability and impact investing, and we'll end the four-day conference with side hustles, building wealth through multiple sources of income. Thank you. So at this time, it gives me uh, great pleasure to introduce our esteemed alumni speaker for this evening. Mimi Shi is a private advisor, vice president at Rockefeller Capital Management. Mimi began her wealth management career in Vancouver, Canada at CIBC Wood Gunny Advising, domestic and international ultra high net worth individuals on tax efficient, traditional and non-traditional investing. She has joined Orcs Legacy Partners where, she, where her responsibilities include reviewing portfolio strategies, reviewing ESG and impact strategies, and relationship management for notable families, foundations, and institutions. Mimi received her BSc from the University of Southern California Marshall School of Business and her MBA from the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management. Mimi serves on Reaching Out MBA Advisory Council and is the co-chair of the Rotman New York City Alumni Chapter. For her contributions to women and the LGBTQ plus community, Mimi was recognized as a Forte and Romba Fellow. Mimi is a frequent speaker at conferences on topics ranging from portfolio management to community engagement. A strong proponent of giving back to the community, Mimi mentors students at the University of Southern California. Mimi enjoys pushing her limits and has run three, not one, not two, but three international marathons and is originally from Taiwan. Mimi has also lived in Vancouver, Los Angeles, Shanghai, and Toronto. She now resides in Manhattan with her dog, Mocha. So please join me in giving a warm USC Trojan welcome, virtual welcome to our speaker for this evening, discussing investing 201, Mimi Shi. Mimi? Thank you, Lori. Very much appreciated for the introduction. Very proud Trojan here, graduated in the year of 2012. I'm dating myself, but very happy to be back. I've been in wealth management my entire career. So if I can give back to the community in any way, I am more than happy to do it. Some of you might have joined me in the session Investing 101 yesterday, 
And today, Investing 201 will just build on that, uh, what we discussed yesterday, just a little bit more. So oh, let me just, here we go. Uh, Rockefeller Family uh, Financial Education, we really do this with the next generation of notable families. However, the way that I approach it, you know, I've spoken with both some of our clients next gen where they are about to inherit substantial wealth or I'm about to give a lesson to some of my peers who are in their early 30s as they are starting to build their own wealth. So this can really be used across all different um, wealth stages and I hope you will get something out of it, if not a little deeper dive from Investing 101. So throughout the spectrum, we did Investing 101, which really goes into the basics of fundamental investing. And Investing 201 is, we're really laying uh, layering the next asset class, which is the alternatives, and then continue to build on the building blocks of portfolio construction. And as we would progress typically along with the curriculum, then we have a deeper dive into alternatives, history of bull and bear markets. But today we'll be focusing on 201 just to continue laying the groundwork. So yesterday we talked about the different asset classes and why it was really important to have a diversification across cash and cash equivalents, fixed income, equities. We've also touched upon the characteristics of cash and cash equivalents, which, uh, which include commercial paper, money market funds, savings accounts. We talked about how they are highly liquid. However, your returns, you don't generate that much. We talked about fixed income as an asset class and how that includes debt instruments, bonds, how that's seen as a loan, and how you charge an interest rate, which is the income that you'll be receiving with a bond. We've discussed the credit quality of different bonds ranging from high quality, high quality credit, such as the US Treasury, and then those with a lower credit rating, such as emerging market debt. We've also touched upon equities, ownership in and its form as ownership in, in the companies in the form of stocks and how there are two return profiles within equities, which are the capital growth and then the dividend that it gets paid out um, for the owners of the company. And then finally, today we will talk about the alternative space. Over the last decade, there has been a high correlation between cash, fixed income, and equities. And we're using the alternative space to, as a, a further way to diversify from your portfolio as it is uncorrelated to the remaining asset allocation. And then within alternatives, we'll touch a little bit on private equity. We'll touch a little bit on venture capital, hedge funds, and then other categories of alternatives. When we think about alternatives, we also want to include real estate, we include crypto, we include um, art, wine. Those are all considered alternative investment because they do not fit in the categories of cash, fixed income, or equities. We have clients who dabble in alternatives quite a bit. And as a firm, Rockefeller, we have a higher allocation to alternatives because we believe in that space, but I am not going to bore you with the nitty gritty details of that. So breaking down alternatives, they are considered assets that are not, again, cash bonds or equities. They are riskier. They are riskier due to its lower liquidity. There's typically a locked in period that you have to account for. However, with the illiquidity constraint, there is the potential for higher return. Um, some of the examples, as I mentioned, we have the private equity, hedge funds, real estate, commodities, and collectibles. Within the traditional investments, if we just wanted to do a side-by-side -side comparison, 
anything that is cash, bonds, and equities, publicly traded, you can find it on the S&P 500, or you can find it on the bond market. It's all available for you to uh, buy in and out on a daily liquidity. So the liquidity would be higher. The time horizon is really varies across short, medium, long term. If you remember, we had the three different buckets. We had the short term bucket from zero to five years. What would you need to save for in the next five years? We had the medium term bucket where it's anywhere from five to 10 years. What are the immediate investing needs of five to 10 years down the road? And then long term, what are we using for this final bucket, which can be used for things such as retirement or leaving a legacy? Typically, the risk is quote unquote lower. Remember that there is no investment out there that has zero risk. And it is highly regulated. The complexity would be lower as well. And the investor base, we're really looking at retail, high net worth, and institutional investors who would be uh, primarily investing in the traditional investments. Now, when we think about the alternative space, it's not publicly traded. You typically have to buy it from either an institution or a brokerage where they have a fund that is associated that has been vetted through the firm and their due diligence. The liquidity, like I mentioned, is lower. Typically an investment could last anywhere from 10 to 12 years. Time horizon, again, it's longer term, 10 to 12 years. And then the risk is higher due to the illiquidity risk. The regulation, it's less regulated, which makes it riskier. And then the complexity, it is more complex, especially when we're starting to get into hedge funds that really employ long short strategies or uh, the use of derivatives. And then for the investor base, typically you have to be a qualified pur purchaser or, or an accredited investor. So this is more targeted towards the ultra high net worth and institutional investors. Uh, portfolio diversification. So again, yesterday we did talk about the three very standard um, investment buckets. We talked about risk tolerance and how it builds into your total uh, risk appetite for your portfolio, whether you wanted to take a look at your risk attitude or your risk ability to take on risk. And really, we're just adding another sleeve into it. And in the conservative bucket, you'll see that there is an exposure to alternatives in 10%. And then moving on next is the moderate allocation, which you're really just slightly increasing the alternative exposure. The equities would be 50% of the portfolio. The fixed income would be 50% of the portfolio, but you are willing to take on a little more of that risk and uh, exposure just by diversi diversifying with alternatives. And then finally, the aggressive portfolio, which we'll see with 75% equities, 25% uh, fixed income, and then 30% alternatives to round it out. So it plays a part into the whole picture of 100% allocation. So the advantages of the alternative investments, uh, typically, as I mentioned earlier, lower correlation with traditional investments. I know in the previous slide, we had the three different buckets and how that would work amongst each other. You have the 10% alternatives, and then you would adjust accordingly to the fixed income and the equities. If we have, um, it, typically the uh, alternatives would also be, quote unquote, there is the absolute risk and return metrics that are similar to the uh, equities and then the fixed income. So that's something to keep in mind as well as you're thinking about how to really craft a portfolio. There is the potential for higher returns, which is why a lot of individuals have a preference for uh, the alternative space. And then there is that wider range of investment opportunities, which like I mentioned, you have private equity, you have venture capital, private debt, hedge funds, structured products, distressed debt, derivatives, 
commodities, real estate, intellectual property, and collectibles. And just to lightly touch on a couple of the ones that we will not be diving deeper into today, structured products as an example, some of these structures you'll be seeing, it employs option strategies pegged to oftentimes a single strategy or single note, uh, a single uh, index or a stock. And it provide, provides a downside protection and an upside of whether you wanna say it's amplified through growth or whether it's through income. But these products are really structured through the structured products desk. And we've seen the growth and popularity over the last decade. Real estate, there are real estate families out there who really believe in investing purely in real estate. And there's a reason for it because you do collect that income from real estate as well as the potential for capital growth. Collectibles, as I mentioned earlier, art, wine, cars sometimes, these are all considered collectibles. Anything that um, people see as a store of value. Watches sometimes even, especially watches. Next, some of the risks that we have seen with the alternative investments, we touched upon the illiquidity list risk, which really means that during the fund investment period and the fund term, it is hard to liquidate from your investment. Sometimes you can, however, there comes with it a penalty. Some of the valuation risk when you're thinking about private equity, venture capital, it's not as easily uh, valued as a as a a stock that's listed on the S and P because that one you get to see the day to day price movement. But when you're investing in a great idea, you know you're really thinking about Uber pre IPO. There is no way to really get the valuation until, unless it is actually evaluated by a, uh, a second uh, third party firm. Some of these alternative investments will also employ leverage, which means we're really boring and that has both pros and cons. It can really amplify the returns or it can magnify the losses. But this in essence would also make the alternative investment riskier. And then finally, higher fees. Um, the alternative space is known for higher fees. Uh, you'll typically find, or you used to typically find it around the 2% management fee, which if you compare it to ETFs, we're looking at maybe 10 basis points or 0.1% on the medium range of fees. If you're looking at an S&P 500 ETF, you're looking at 0.03% fees. Um, and then if you compare it to alternatives, we're looking at 2%. There's been some talk in the industry. There's been a lot of scrutiny in the industry. So for certain funds, you'll actually find that closer to 1.5%. But that only goes to highlight that the fees are inherently higher in the, uh, in the alternative space. So breaking down a few of the major uh, types of alternatives, the really popular ones, private equity, as I'm sure everyone's heard of private equity, it really is a fund that raises money from investors. And then we use that money to buy stakes in privately held businesses with the goal of later selling to make a profit. And the different categorization of private equity really is determined by at what stage the company is in. When we're thinking about venture capital, that's anywhere from you know angel investor to series A. It's a very promising startup. And oftentimes in VC, you'll find that there is a bell bar, bell bar curve for returns. And that you, know, you have some ideas, some companies that will go bust with zero return. But then in some companies, they will really shoot the lights out and you'll get 100% return. But VC is inherently the most risky of the categories. For growth capital, you're really looking at the companies that have matured. They've had their series A, uh, they've gone through their series A liquidity, and really they are able to uh, 
prove that their this idea, their business is viable with repeat customers with a strong revenue growth. Typically, you'll see this in maybe 20% revenue growth. And there is the potential for the companies to expand farther and to build out new product lines. And at this point, they may require that liquidity to continue sustaining the business and continue expanding uh, on the business plan. And finally, we have buyouts. Buyouts is where you see the company come in and buy controlling share or majority of the um, of the ownership of the company. And that's oftentimes used as a way to restructure um, restructure the company. And just a quick example, if everyone knows, everyone knows Hilton. Everyone knows Hilton. And that was one of the uh, firms that went to a leveraged buyout, $26 billion bought by Blackstone Group in 2007. Blackstone improved Hilton's operations and then sold them at a profit of $14 billion. So you can see why buyouts are quite attractive. Doesn't necessarily mean that it works all the time, but essentially the other company is coming in and really re-strategizing, really uh, reinvigorating the, the firm that they see potential in. Private debt, also known as private credit. So these are the debt investments not held by a bank or traded on the open market. Oftentimes when a company is looking to grow, it may take on private debt, receive a loan from, from a private debt fund as an alternative to bank lending. Uh, private debt is not illiquid and cannot be traded, but it should not be confused with private equity because there is no ownership in any of the underlying companies. Private debt funds are more flexible, flexible because they are oftentimes open-ended. And then the returns are achieved through interest rate loans. So in today's current interest rate environment, there's a lot of talk uh, of how, you know, if you put your investment in even T-bills, you're really, uh, it's above 5%. In money market, it's above 5%. So that is because of the current interest rate environment. When you're seeing that translated to private credit or private debt, you can see that it would be higher because... Oftentimes it'll be higher because what you're getting in the public market, you're actually able to get in the private market with a fund. And we have a couple of examples of that on the platform. And then we have hedge funds. Hedge funds are considered pool investment structures that use different strategies to generate alpha. What alpha means is basically it's the active return on the investment and it's just a fancy way of saying, what am I doing as an investment professional to make more value for people who decide to invest with me? So hedge funds like mutual funds are actively managed by investment professionals. And what is the difference between a hedge fund and a mutual fund? So we had that comparison before on the Traditional investments, the public market, mutual fund uh, is included in one of those, how it is publicly, or it's public and it's highly regulated. Hedge funds, on the other hand, are not as heavily regulated. They use non-traditional strategies like derivatives, and these strategies will often have a lot of risk associated with it. They are exclusively for high net worth individuals and institutional investors. Like I mentioned earlier, much less regulatory oversight. And a few of the strategies are, you'll have global macro, long short equity, risk arbitrage, and multi-strat. With global macro, we're really looking at, uh, I saw another fund recently, which was focused on the emerging market space. Now, instead of having an ETF that is pegged to emerging markets, which includes all of the countries, all of the BRICS, you have a, an emerging market hedge fund where their focus is really doing their own analysis, their own understanding of which company is best right now to invest in. And why does that matter? Yesterday, I talked really briefly on what the performance numbers for the year of 2023 were. 
if we're looking again, and I'm just using emerging markets as, as an example, because I was looking at a fund recently where, you know, China was down 30%. You look at India's up 35%, China, Taiwan was up 30%. And that really, the purpose of the hedge fund is really to be able to pick up on the economic sensitivities, sometimes the geopolitical risk that is in a specific region and tailor it to tailor the investment um, hypothesis to that. Now, the long short equity, these are funds that will take a long position or a short position. Um, what a long position means is that, you know, a lot of uh, investment professionals believe that this company will skyrocket, will be a really strong performer. Now, on the flip side, the short position is when stocks are expected to plummet, they're expected to depreciate. And if anyone remembers GameStop, that was a classic uh, squeeze where a lot of companies, a lot of, or there were some hedge funds that really believed that GameStop would, uh, they shorted GameStop, uh, GameStop in, essentially, they expected the stock to decline and a bunch of investors rallied together and decided to push up GameStop's uh, stock price. And that hedge fund actually uh, collapsed. Risk arbitrage, this one is really using uh, the profit from the gap between the trading stock of a price and the acquirer's valuation of that stock during a takeover deal. And then the final one is multi-strat, which is really a combination of uh, a few of the different hedge fund strategies. Next, we have real estate. Real estate has uh, it has its purpose in a portfolio. Aside from just as your principal residence, um, a lot of individuals will buy properties such as land and buildings as an investment. Uh, oftentimes, you'll have the cash flow from tenants as the income and the dividend. And they'll share character characteristics with equity in the sense that the goal could be an increase in the property value. So for an example, I'm trying to think about some place in LA, um, downtown LA, pre-COVID, the property price there started to appreciate. So that in itself is, you can consider it as stock appreciation. If the rent was to appreciate, that would also be the dividend that's associated to that either condo or that building. So that, in a sense, is a way for you to really build up the equity in your portfolio or as an alternative investment for you to really um, consider. The one caveat to real estate is that it is a lot more capital intensive, although there are uh, REITs, which are the real estate investment trusts, that you can invest in that are on the public markets. A REIT manager, like I mentioned earlier, they invest money in different properties and then they manage those and collect rent on properties. And then the dividends or the rent is distributed to investors. Potential benefits to investing in real estate, you get tax breaks. There's the uh, 1031 tax break, where if you have an investment, you can roll over the capital gains to a different investment property and not have to pay taxes. Not forever, because you'll eventually have to pay taxes, but unless until you don't have another investment property to invest in, um, you won't have to pay those taxes. Again, that is there's also the ability to diversify your portfolio. There's the regular income that you can generate and then inflation protection. And then finally, we have commodities. Commodities are when individuals buy raw materials as an investment. Raw materials, we're really looking at um, the four big categories of energy, metals, livestock, and meat, agricultural. The goal is to increase the resource value in the long term and one of the things about um, commodities is that it can actually quite be quite seasonal. So if you're really thinking about when are we using gasoline the most, when are we using natural gas the most? So there is this, the natural cycle with it. You'll notice also that with the metals, 
certain times you'll actually require you'll actually want to invest in gold more if there is that fear um gold is often seen as a uh, safe haven and we actually just as uh, an example we have a client who is a little more conservative she's a little afraid of geopolitics so she will buy uh, gold and gold reserves held in Switzerland. In agricultural, you have corn, soy, uh, soybeans, wheat, and coca, livestock and meat, lean hogs, pork bellies, live cattle, and feeder cattle. And one last category that has actually gotten quite uh, a bit more attention recently um, is direct investments. What do I mean by direct investments? This is really when you're trying to directly invest in the operating company that you're designating. So for example, SpaceX. SpaceX was an investment that was available on the platform. What this means is that you are actually able to buy into SpaceX and own a percentage of that single company for let's say $250,000 as the minimum investment. So how does this work? It's unlike a private equity fund where we're actually looking at multiple of the direct investments. But for this one, this one is specifically just in SpaceX. And oftentimes this is um, sourced through your network or within, it's typically done through a network. And you'll see a lot of those with, uh, with companies that have that extensive network built into it. Um, direct versus fund investing. So direct investing differs from fund investing because like I mentioned, direct uh, investing is a clear path to owning private equity. Whereas a fund is a pool of investors investing in a portfolio of the operating company. The benefits of doing direct investments the management fees that I was talking about earlier, the 2%, sometimes 1% or 1.5% management fee. There is no management fee. The investments can align more closely with the values and mindset of the investor. And then there is greater control and transparency over the investments. And what you're really doing is taking a concentrated bet on any company, whether it's SpaceX or IHOP was one that was on the platform too, and uh, really putting your convictions behind that. And that is the end of Investing 201. Typically, we like to end with really asking everyone to think about their personal investing goals. What do you want to achieve out of your investments? And really digging into your risk tolerance, which we discussed yesterday. And if you want a brief, uh, Primer, which is really thinking about your tolerance towards risk by the ability to take on risk and then your attitude towards risk. And you always want to go towards the less um, less risky uh, less risky measurements. And then really your time horizon for your basket of assets. And then next, what types of investments are you interested in learning about? Really thinking about this as you continue your education journey within financial literacy. Obviously today I'm really talking about a very high level overview of the alternative space. Tomorrow will be sustainable and impact investing. And then really just taking a look at what your current investment portfolio look like. Make sure that it's well diversified. If there is room and space for alternatives, then I would consider alternatives as well, as long as it meets the liquidity requirements and uh, your risk appetite. And now I would like to open the floor up to questions. Thank you so much, Mimi. This was so informative. And we have quite a few great questions and they're they're coming in fast and furious. So we'll start. Fast and furious. We'll start with the first one, which is, should I take advantage of mega backdoor Roth if my company provides this option? That is really hard to look at in isolation because I'd want to consider your entire financial picture. One of the things that we do on the team is before making any investment decision, we really want to take a look at your cash flows, whether that is your inflows, outflows. 
and um, what the expectations are for upcoming liquidity needs. And I'm always hesitant to make a, an offhand remark as that because you have to think about your financial wealth as holistic. You know, one thing will impact the other and you don't want to make a decision that could eventually impact you down the line. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, our next question is, how do I invest in private equity companies? If my expected AGI is 200,000, will I qualify for private equity investments? Yeah, so there are a, a few different metrics to qualify for private equity. Uh, in terms of sourcing deals, you can either reach out to the fund companies or you typically you would buy them through an institution. So, you know, JP Morgan, Rockefeller, uh, Morgan Stanley, those are the ones that will actually provide the private equities uh, deals on the um, platform. And then you can submit a ticket. Uh, the 200 net worth usually is, it's based on a couple of years, so it can't just be a single year. And then there is also a net worth requirement that you'd have to adhere to. So they do keep it a pretty, as unregulated as we want to talk about private equity, um, there are certain requirements for you to be able to purchase it. Okay, thank you. Our next question, is it a good idea to invest in REITs in tax-advantaged retirement accounts or regular brokerage accounts? Uh, typically, I want to put um, REITs are more closely related to equity. So I would say we usually put fixed income in retirement accounts simply because you're not going to be able to harvest the capital losses. If you really think about equities and fixed income, your fixed income will typically um, be the uh, investments that depreciate less. And you really want to be able to take advantage of harvesting losses, which is something that we regularly do at the end of every year and throughout the year, where, you know, if you know that a stock is going down, you tax loss harvest, so you can pay less tax down the road. Now, REITs is more considered in the equity line. So taking a look at your total portfolio, again, I don't want to answer, answer this question without seeing the full picture but I tend to allocate fixed income into retirement accounts more before thinking about equities. Okay, thank you. Here's another great question. You mentioned your client who's buying gold in, in Switzerland. Um, how does one buy gold or platinum bullions? So gold physically, you can certainly buy physical bars of gold, um, but it's not the most practical way. There are certain ETF, GDX um, that you can use to buy. You can buy uh, um, uh, ETFs that are related to gold mining as well, or it, it related to gold. So you're thinking about mining companies that um, you'd really be exposed to. I, IAU is also another ticker that you can take a look at. Another question is, if I'm looking to invest money for the long term right now, would you suggest putting money into a high yield savings account or a certificate of deposit? Um, that is a, you'd have to take a look at the interest rate. So the CDs, as we discussed yesterday, and the high yield savings account, CDs, you get to lock in the interest rate for however long the term of the CD is. So if it's a three, five year CD, then you're really locking in the interest rate for three to five years. Um, on the other hand, high yield savings accounts, that interest rate will fluctuate. Um, if the Fed wants to decrease the interest rate, then that will also impact the savings rate. If the SOFR decreases, then your interest rate will decrease along with that. But again, with CDs, you can't easily liquidate from CDs. So that's another caveat that I would mention that if you put it in a CD, it's gonna be locked in for that duration unless you are willing to pay a penalty to um, withdraw the funds. Thank you. Any advice on 529s or custodial accounts? Um, 529s, I think there is a, um, a very, it's, it's a great vehicle to really help save for education for either yourself or your kids or, you can really designate it to anyone. Um, there are oftentimes tax breaks. So I definitely look at the different 529 plans that are available in every state. 
uh, because some plans will have tax benefits, whereas some others won't, particular to that state. So to give you an example, um, New York, New York saves, um, New York saves are, they give you a tax break if you contribute anything like $5,000. That's the limit every year. For a national 529 plan like College America, they won't provide that tax break for you in New York as a New York resident. So these are some of the things that you should do some research on before you decide to uh, start using a 529 plan. Okay, and a follow-up to that, can you um, purchase a 529 plan in a state that you're not living in? Yes, you can, but you don't get the tax break. Okay. All right, another question is on international investing. Um, may I ask your thoughts on diversifying via the Tokyo Stock Exchange? Seeing a Japanese, seeing as Japanese stocks seem to be on the rise. I would, you can purchase on the uh, Nikkei. That is possible. Um, it really depends on how, if you actually want to convert your currency over to. And this is really funny because I actually had family. Um, I was calling family in Taiwan. There was an earthquake. Instead, they're asking me about investing in Japan. I'm like, okay, I'm calling you because I'm concerned about you guys. Um, so if you do want to convert your US dollar or whichever currency that you have to Japan or JPY, then obviously it's at the end, you obviously can. Um, you just have to be mindful of the currency fluctuations along with it. Okay. And there are also different investing styles across every uh, country. So. Lori mentioned that I lived in Shanghai before. When I was living in Shanghai, the market is drastically different from what you would experience in the US or in Canada, because I'm originally from Canada. Um, so I would be cognizant of that. I think obviously Shanghai is also a more unregulated market, but in the sense that you want to make sure that you understand the uh, market that you're investing. If you're looking at fundamentals and technicals, then that would be more across the board. Wonderful. Here's a question for somebody with a that has a high appetite, um, a risk, a risk, high risk appetite. How do I get started with investing um, right away in private debt if they have a high risk appetite? You have a high risk appetite, then you start lending money to your friends and charge them 100% interest. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> If you, if you have a high risk appetite, then you don't have to just look at private debt or private credit. You really want to diversify across the spectrum, like I mentioned earlier. And, you know, there was that pie chart where you had the 50-50 and maybe 10 or 20% alternatives. Like you really want to approach it across the spectrum because it, private debt could not provide as much of the return as you want from another asset class, for example, private equity. Um, so you can do it and you typically do it through an institution. However, I'd also encourage you to diversify. Private debt is also on the, if you're really thinking about the risk spectrum, it's not as risky as, for example, um, private equity, because the private debt will always get, it's higher on the cap table than the, uh, than private equity is. Okay. Thank you. Um, what's I know this is a great session that we're in, and we have a lot of Trojans who are, are are wanting to learn more. This is a great question. What are some great resources to learn more about investing? Is there a resource or books you recommend that that our our listeners can take advantage of? Of course, um, I uh, would subscribe to. I listen to Bloomberg every day, and I mentioned this yesterday. Um, really, just getting to know the markets more and. When it comes to the alternative space, you know, we typically have client calls like launch calls where if a fund is approved on the platform, then we are able to, we'll, we'll have a due diligence call with it. We'll have the fund manager on, on the call and really talk about um, how the, what the underlying, the expectations of the fund is, what the previous vintages, how the previous vintages have performed. Um, those are all ways to really get to know uh, more, uh, get to accumulate more knowledge on, on the markets. Okay, here's a really good question. My student is graduating and there will be leftover funds in the 529. 
What mm -hmm. is the new 2024 law that allows my student to withdraw 529 funds to fund their own Roth IRA? Um, that one is, uh, oh, sorry, could you say that again? Yes, yes. My student is graduating and there will be leftover funds in the 529. What is the new 2024 law that allows my student to withdraw 529 funds to fund their Roth IRA? I'd have to get back to you on that um, because I, to be quite frank, don't have that one off the top of my mind. I do know that for 529s, you are able to reassign it to someone else if that is of any interest. But in terms of drawing out the funds and, and Roth, it, the tax laws change year to year. So this is something that I'd actually have to take a deeper look into. Into, okay, great. Um, this is a good segue to our session that starts at 6 p.m. in uh, a few minutes. Uh, what investment method would you advise um, as I use for buying a house maybe in the next three to five years? So this is somebody who's going to put money away, maybe make some money so that they can buy a house, real estate. Yeah. So we talked about this a little earlier where you have the three different buckets. You have the short-term fund, the medium-term fund, and the long-term fund. So really depending on how much you have saved put away and really taking into what your risk tolerance, your appetite, your ability to take on risk is, that's when you really start crafting what the asset allocation of that basket is. If you have immediate fund needs, I would say you wouldn't want it to be too high on the risk spectrum because you want to be able to use it in, in five years. If all of a sudden the market takes a downturn, if we don't come on to the soft landing that everyone is now expecting and we head into a recession, then you don't want to put your capital at risk for buying that home in a couple of years time. So you want to take less risk from that perspective. Okay, wonderful. And we have some people that were on at your Money 101 session and they're here now at 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 investing, sorry, investing 101 and now they're here at investing 201 and they asked the question, you mentioned yesterday about Rockefeller's weekly newsletter. How can our listeners subscribe? I uh I mentioned that to get send me an email and I will just leave my email in here and happy to add anyone to it. It's just a weekly um, newsletter that we send out to all of our clients that really talk about, you know, we can review how did the US markets do, how did the international markets do, and some of the headlines like, is the Fed about to meet and how, what the expectations for interest rates would be. Thank you, Mimi, for sharing your email. Here's a question. We've had a few around the topic of cryptocurrency. Thoughts on cryptocurrency and how to make investment decisions in that space, knowing that 99% of the coins out there are going to fail. What's your mindset toward investing in crypto? Is it a, is it a bet on an emerging technology's success? It's is betting on an emerging technology. I would even go as far as to say emerging way of life. Do not put the down payment of your home in it. That is number one. It is still considered a highly risky investment. Um, I would stick to the main coins that you know. So you're really thinking Ethereum, you're thinking uh, Bitcoin. And you know if you wanna put 5% of your portfolio in it, that is about as much as I would. This also depends on how risky you really are. And that is an acceptable amount. However, with every investment, there are pros and cons. And crypto being as unregulated as it is, that's not to say I don't think there is a use case for it. And I personally believe in where technology could be headed. Um, but exercise caution especially when it comes to crypto, because you're seeing a lot of coins getting shut down and it's just a very highly unregulated space. Good. Here's another question. Um, what happens to investment and retirement accounts slash funds when a person gets married? 
Uh, retirement funds. So you still maintain the retirement funds. And what's actually beneficial is that if something was to happen, God forbid, you also list who your spouse is. So you would change the designation. If something was to happen to you and your spouse was still alive, the funds actually transfer to your spouse tax-free and you'll be able to, they'll be able to use those funds or they can roll it into their um, IRA. And it's just another way for the assets to pass tax-free before it gets ultimately taxed. And it'll go to help support your spouse's um, lifestyle. Um, let's see. We have so many good questions here. Thanks, Trojans, for all these great questions. Um, how does home equity work as a trustee? How does home equity work as a trustee? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand that. I'm not question. sure we understand that question. Okay, we'll move on to another one. Um, let's see. Somebody had a question about CDs versus I bonds. Can what's better to invest in? Uh, I'm assuming I bonds means investment bonds, mm -hmm. um, grade bonds. CDs, like I mentioned, they are locked in for a certain period of time. Any investment grade bonds, you can you can sell them, you know, at any point. Um, so at that point, it really is liquidity standpoint, and the CDs would be more classified in the cash cap equivalence classification, whereas investment grade bonds are more fixed income. The only really interesting thing right now is because of the interest rate environment, you're getting higher, um, the interest rate on CDs are higher than they normally would be. Right. Another question is um, universal index life insurance. Is that a good investment? Mm -hmm. Man, you guys are coming at me with these questions. I know, they have a lot of great ones. <laughs> it is, great questions. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it, it is for some people because essentially you're investing in the market along with your life insurance. If you really had to take a long-term view of the markets, the market's always gone up, even past, you know, recessions. It, you know, a, one of my, the partners on the team calls himself a permable which essentially just means he doesn't care what big disaster happens. He believes, fundamentally believes that the markets will continue to appreciate. Now, what you're doing with the life insurance is really thinking about the functionality of it. You know, sometimes people buy it for estate purposes to make sure they pay off their estate taxes. Some people see it as a, an ability to pull out funds because you can, you can loan against your life insurance. So, then the final question is, are you comfortable uh, betting on your the death benefit of your life insurance? Because if you know that, you know, the current lifetime gift tax exemption is at, you know, 1292, I believe, 1292 million, where if your net worth is above that, you're going to get taxed at 40%. So if you really want to bet on the asset that you set aside for your uh to pay off any estate taxes upon death you certainly can um some people do some people don't so it really depends on the individual because just as the markets can go up and your death benefit can go up it can also go the other way well thank you so much mimi thank you usc trojans for joining us for investing 201 this evening we appreciate if you want to see mimi again she'll be back here again same time 5 p.m. Pacific, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time to talk about um, sustainability investing. And, and so we'll talk about that tomorrow. We thank everybody for coming. And again, Mimi, for your wonderful expertise in taking all these questions that were all over the place, but very interesting and important information for us to know. And um, shall we say fight on, Mimi? Of course. Okay, fight on. Fight on, Trojans. See you at six at the Home Buyers session. Bye-bye. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks. Bye.